by the way, there are Words of Radiance spoilers ahead. Sorry, it was kind of unavoidable. So if you're reading through the Stormlight Archive series and aren't to the very end of the second book, click out, come back when you're done. However, if you've already gotten there or have no interest in reading fantasy, even if it's one of the best series ever written and will probably change your life, or don't think that you can emotionally commit to a series that is this long and isn't even halfway done yet, feel free to continue. Have you ever been reading a book that was A. Amazing, and 2. Had discernible cover art of a likable character wearing distinctive and visually appealing clothes and just been like, <coughs> it happened again? <coughs> well, if you have, let me know, because they seem kind of hard to find, or maybe I'm just bad at looking, or maybe I have bad taste. Either way, who doesn't want an ever-growing list of costume ideas that's probably too long to ever finish in this lifetime? Anyway, the point being, I... The aforementioned scenario happened with me and this book, which is Oathbringer by Brandon Sanderson in the Stormlight Archive series. The cover art by Michael Whelan depicts Yasuna Kalin wearing a hava. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to make this. We'll see what happens. Oh, and if you're wondering why I'm wearing this expertly, expertly crafted safe hand sleeve, it's because we're an Aleph card. And here on this channel, we observe the mantra, sharp sign, modest is hottest. And if you think that this bright-eyed lady is going to expose the bear of a um, um, flesh of her safe hand, then you, Bright Lord Our Lady, are uh, gravely mistaken. First, I started off with a sketch that I made in my planner for some reason, but never fear, and ended up in the right place. I suppose I didn't really need a sketch since I was basically just going off of the cover art, but I was able to better picture the one main change that I had made at this point, which was the front side panel with buttons, plus it helped me plan out the different elements of the costume and the best order in which to make them. the lining of this dress that I originally thrifted because of this gem heart of a trim for these Victorian cycling pant World War II German officer dress uniform pant. It's a good fit because it's a close color match. Oh, speaking of color, so this hava is described in the book as being yellow and gold, but I generally dislike the color yellow, so I'd like to personally thank Michael Whelan for taking such a broad interpretation of the word yellow and avoiding the travesty that could have been this cover. And just by the way, I'll be going off of the colors in the cover, not the ones described in the scene. It's shiny, it's moisture wicking, and most importantly, it's stretchy, because what even are pants? I, they're very confusing garments, and while I enjoy wearing them, I've avoided making them for as long as I could, but evidently this is the day in which I must take a leap of faith into the chasm and hope for the best, but I am going to need the forgiveness of stretchy material if this is ever going to work. In order to make anything out of this dress, I must first seam rip the entire thing apart, and try as I might to do this with the safe hand sleeve, I'm not lopen. I've been doing things with two hands for a large majority of my life, so I fervently apologize for what you're about to see. Feel free to hide your children, gasp in shock, grasp your pearls, and exclaim, MY DELICATE SENSIBILITIES! <laughs> and with my dignity and self-propriety dead, I gave the dress a thorough autopsy. By the way, if you've never seam ripped a garment apart to make it into something else, I would highly recommend putting it on your bucket list. It's extremely satisfying. Plus, it gives a positive connotation to a tool that's usually only used in anger and frustration because you mess something up. Seriously, your seam ripper deserves to see you happy at least once in its short lifetime before it disappears into the alternate dimension populated by lost hair ties, bobby pins, and pencils. I left the skirt lining intact so that I could use the nice clean serge seams because I don't have a serger, nor do I have the surge of cohesion, tension. I'm sorry, I know there's gotta be some good joke in there, but I just, I really couldn't find it. Now fold a pair of pants down the middle and lay it over your fabric with the lateral edges in line with a fold or folded seam and trace them down. If they are a more form-fitting pair of pants than are the trousers that Yasuna is wearing, which they probably are unless you're a Victorian cyclist or World War II German officer in full dress uniform, then you'll want wider leg sleeves to get that bunchy look. So just trace the waist front seam part and then draw a line straight down from there. Cut this out with extra seam allowance, because you know my motto, you can fix any mistake with enough seam allowance, and replicate this process on the other side. If you're making these trousers out of a similarly sized and shaped piece of fabric as me, at this point you should have a toilet plunger shaped remnant. Lay the two pieces on top of each other right sides together as if they were a very large tank top. Now pin and sew the arm size of that tank top closed because who even needs arms? Take the two seams you just made and fold the pants so that they line up on top of each other in the middle. 
then sew along the medial edges of the leg sleeves to where they meet in the middle. I tried it on and realized that the trousers felt quite low on my torso. To rectify this, I used pieces from my shard blade shape, I mean toilet plunger shaped remnant to raise the waist. Then, so it would stay in place, I measured elastic to fit around my waist and sewed it into a loop. I marked eight more or less equidistant points on both the elastic loop and the top of the waist of the trousers and pinned the elastic to the waist at each point. Then I zigzag stitched them together, folding the fabric over the elastic and stretching it slightly as I ran it through the sewing machine to match the length of the elastic with the length of the fabric. I tried just tucking the pants into the boots, but they weren't long enough and they kept coming out. So I made them into Hamilton looking trousers by gathering them to the width of my calves around where they would end. And then for each leg sleeve, taking an extra strip of fabric and sewing it into a loop that fit around the bottom edge and then sewing it to the trousers right sides together and then folding it around the edges and hand sewing it to the inside. And voila, your very own lady trousers. But what's this? A high storm? An ever storm? Nothing so mundane. Está nevando en tejas! It's snowing! There is snow in my backyard. There is snow on my driveway. There is snow on my trash can. There is snow on the brown mulch. Yeah, it kind of just goes on like that for a while. Uh, snow is not common in these here parts, but it is my favorite natural phenomena, so I take advantage when I can. Oh, don't mind me, just growing some snow here. Though I now must admit this is starting to get slightly embarrassing. Oh god, my hand is cold. Oh goodness, moving on. I have it on good authority that the sleeves are the same color as the pants. See, I always thought that the sleeves were a completely different color, somewhere around the kingdom of burgundy or maybe maroon, and I was trying to decide on a few fabrics. So I texted pictures to my friend and she was like, none of these are right. The sleeves are the same goldish color as the pants, and they just look a little bit different because of shading, and which I had never considered, and it reminded me of this fun moment in fashion history. But anyway, so on a whim, more just so I could say that I did it rather than actually expecting anything to come from it, I tweeted Michael Whelan, the cover artist, and his assistant Michael Gray, and to which they actually, they responded. <laughs> and indeed I was incorrect and they're the same color. And with that invaluable primary source information, I proceeded to disregard it. I'm sorry, I wasn't being purposefully contrary, but by the time I'd finished the trousers, alas, I only had approximately one square inch with which to make the sleeves. So instead, I used the shell fabric of the same dress, which is, I mean, pretty much the same thing, right? Yes? And I think it actually ended up working better anyway, because it's that thin, gauzy cotton that works well with the poofy sleeves that she seems to be wearing. Now, when making costumes with multiple layers, it's best to start on the inside and work your way out, kind of like the opposite of silver radicate. But I actually did the vest, waistcoat, dress skirt this thing before I did the skirt because if you'll remember the thrifted dress out of which I made this costume had this really beautiful elegant embroidery and it took me a while to convince myself that I needed to rip it out but I finally did so prepare yourself for the worst before and after pairing ever However, I will show the making of the shirt first for ease of sense making. I'm using the existing bodice of the dress as a base for the shirt, but the dress has a v-neck, plus I took out the trim to minimize the bulk and attached the middle seams together, which had the unfortunate effect of substantially deepening the décolletage area. Whereas the shirt Yasuna is wearing has a very high neckline, so I'm taking some extra fabric and sandwiching it into the pizza-shaped hole. This is probably going to look kind of weird, but I may cover it up with a naval ascot, and if not, I'm just hoping that the rest of the costume will distract from the- yeah, that looks kind of weird. On to the sleeves. Now, we can't see her forearms, but I went to the DPS and changed my middle name to Creative Liberties so that I could say- Now, we can't see her forearms, but Creative Liberties is my middle name, and I've always been partial to these 1890s floofy type sleeves with the really wide cuffs that go about three-fourths of the way up your forearm. Which is, by the way, the only time I ever condone the words three-fourths and sleeve in the same sentence. Though not directly because of the historical fashion, but rather because of the original Star Trek movies. Fortunately, I already have pattern pieces for this type of sleeve from the M6819 thinly veiled Snow White from Once Upon a Time costume featured in McCall's It's Not Trademark, So Don't At Me line of costumes. However, if you don't have this pattern because this isn't your favorite generic fantasy style that you cosplay every chance you get, don't sweat it too much. I've heard that the shape of this sleeve is reminiscent of an American Girl doll bed frame. Cut out the same number of these as you have arms. I did two, but anything below or up to three and a half is perfectly acceptable. Fold the sleeve in half and sew it along what will be the inside seam, leaving an inch or so on the bottom open. 
draw a rhythmic curve about an inch from the edge of the shoulder curve and gather it with stitches about one of Sill's palm widths apart. Then pin the gathers and sew the sleeve to the bodice at the arm side. Cut out cuffs from the same pattern and apparently don't film any of it. Yeah, whoops. If you want your cuff to be stiff, you can add some interfacing, but I didn't want to add the extra bulk. Either way, definitely add strips of interfacing to either side where the buttons and buttonholes will be attached. Now cut a loop of thread the length of the cuff and use this thread to gather the bottom of the sleeve so that they match lengths when you line up the ends of the cuff with the ends of the sleeve you previously left open, and pin and sew them together. I don't know if this is the correct way, but it's how I always do it. Sew buttons to one side of the cuff and hand sew buttonholes to the other side, unless you're one of those magical creatures who can get this abomination to work, in that case, more power to you. Now this scene also describes Yasuna being able to open and button back her safe hand sleeve. Unfortunately, due entirely to having run out of fabric at this point and having nothing whatsoever to do with me not being able to figure out how to do that, this feature has been left out. Now onto this part of the costume. I think we're going to call it a vest and skirt panels. I think that's the most accurate description. But stepping back a bit, the Vorn Hobbit is said to be loosely inspired by the Chinese Qi Pao. Qi Pao. Qi Pao. Though upon a closer inspection, it seems like different elements of the dress are inspired by different eras in Chinese fashion history. For example, the use of silk fabric and metallic embroidery, as well as the high mandarin color and the slanted, off-centered front seam, are features seen in Chinese accent garments going long before the advent of the modern qi pao, which only came into being in the 1920s. Though it's important to note the difference between the original 1920s garment and what it's evolved into in the modern day. And though I did some research, it's not nearly enough for you to listen to me as if I know what I'm talking about, so if you would like to learn more, there are video links and article links in the whole shebang. Yasuna, however, is not wearing a traditional light-eyed hava in this scene, but rather a scout hava with shorter skirts slid up the sides and front, trousers underneath. Multiple variations of this description appear in the text, including female messengers in the Kulin army and traveling dresses. Additionally, the vest and shirt combo that Yasuna appears to be wearing is described as what my girl Risen is wearing the first time we meet her. But I for this part of the costume, I mostly stuck to the cover art, though I opted for a version of the front scene depicted in this fashion plate by Dan DeSantos for more accuracy to the text description of Havas, more accuracy to the Chinese influence, plus I just like it. It's very classy, or I don't know, it's doing something right. Though I do want to keep the actual V shape of the neckline so that you can see the shirt underneath because, you know, layering is... A++. Oh, speaking of fashion plates. So, a few months ago I went to an antique store and there were a bunch of fashion plates and it was so cool. I felt like I was just getting more cultured and smart by breathing in the miasma of fashion history. But anyway, here's a fashion plate from, I'm guessing, early 20th century. And it tell me that this is not a safe hand sleeve and pouch. You can't, because it is. Confirmed. I don't know what's confirmed, but something. Is. Now give your eyes a break from the damaging effects of blue light and ignore your screen right now because, see, at some point in the planning of this costume piece, I sort of arbitrarily decided that I was not going to use darts. Darts as in the tailoring method that allows for shaping, not the main saloon pastime and when calls the heart. Because I, well, I looked at the cover art and I thought, oh look, completely smooth, no darts. I mean, I can't, I obviously have to follow this 2D rendition of the garment as the absolute law of its construction methods. <laughs> I mean. And to add to the irony of this moment, this was after I had already decided to completely change the front of the dress by adding the front seam, so I, I can't explain myself. But this is a very hourglassy look in silhouette, so there's a lot of circumference difference between the waist and the bust and hips, which I had to take out almost entirely at the side seams because there wasn't really a front middle seam, so anyway, the mock-ups were just not doing it, so I scrapped them. And in the midst of such a crisis, what is a happy amateur customer to do but consult the 1895 Keystone Guide to Jacket and Dress Cutting by the ever-entertaining Mr. Charles Hecklinger, filled as it is with all of the darts my little heart could desire. I used the double-breasted waistcoat with two darts to make this pattern, but I won't go into much more detail than that because otherwise this video would be as long as the runtime of Rhythm of War, plus using this guide is a definite trial by fire and I wouldn't want to ruin the experience for anyone by being helpful. And after making approximately more mock-ups than Adolin has failed courtships and making more alterations than people Dalinar has killed, I finally had a pattern for the bodice. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. 
Now to trace the pattern pieces onto the fashion fabric, for which we will be using this cream-colored bedsheet that may or may not have been my brother's, but it was so pretty it has such a silky sheen without actually being silk, because I may have the UV sensitivity of a light eyes, but not the reticule of one. Anyway, fold in half the fabric so that you're getting a shell and lining of each piece. So there I was, pattern pieces traced out, pinned down, ready to go, when suddenly I was inexplicably hit with a case of the cutting anxiety. Which, if you're unfamiliar, is defined by the DSM-5 as delaying cutting your fabric for as long as possible, because once cut, there's no going back and you've committed to your pattern. Also, the fabric is no longer pristine and perfect, which is sad. The symptoms manifest in three or more of the following delaying tactics. One, staring morosely at your fabric. Two, checking and rechecking that the pieces were drawn correctly onto the fabric. Three, trying on previous mock-ups and wondering if they were, in fact, superior to the one that you ended up using. Four, studying. Five, doing literally everything else on your to-do list. Six, practicing your wit impersonation. <laughs> As you can imagine, all of that procrastination worked up quite an appetite, so I ordered some food and oh look, a fortune cookie. Are you, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. Even my dinner mocks me. So in a fit of rage and possessed by the thrill, I burned that thing like a prayer. What? So, okay, I tried to. Seriously, what is happening? This is not nearly as cinematic as I envisioned. That's right, burn and braze, old bringer. But anyway, indeed I heeded the aged wisdom of the faceless random fortune generator corporation and cut out the gosh darn thing. Then I set to pinning and sewing the darts as well as the pattern pieces together. This took way longer than expected and needed far more pins than expected because this fabric is emphatically slidey, ornery, and difficult. I mean, the pieces would not stay in the same place relative to each other. Like, if lift could embody a fabric, this would be it. So I adopted a method of folding the dart, then stabbing through the line on one side of the fabric, then checking the other side to see if it went through that line as well, and if it didn't, I would take the pin out, slide the lines closer together, and then try again. I did this every inch or so, and then left those pins in as I pinned the fabric together regularly, and then I took out those perpendicular pins and sewed along the line. Then I pressed the seams open and the darts toward the side of the body. The side seams are slightly concave, so I had to snip them, otherwise they'd pucker when flipped right side out. But snipping seams makes them more difficult to finish, and I definitely needed to finish these seams because another thing about this fabric is that it is remarkably fray... fray... fray prone to fraying, so I used this fray check fabriol and then finished the other seams with it and then finished the rest of the seams in the entire garment with it and actually might have gotten slightly dependent on it. Then I laid the lining and shell right sides together and pinned the edges using the same method as before. Basted all of the inner seams and darts together and sewed along the edges except for the neckline so that after I undid the basting stitches I could flip it right side out and oh Stormfather what have I done. So I think I wasn't supposed to sew the arm size until after flipping it right side out I think. But in my defense, and if it's any indication by my reaction to snow, I'm not used to cold weather and I rarely line things, so I don't really understand the mechanics, but yay learning things, I suppose. Now as I seam rip this arm sigh, join me as I ponder the term arm sigh. Arm sigh is another word for arm hole. Apparently it originated as arm's eye, but has since evolved to a far more amusing spelling. See, it can either be one word, A-R-M-S-C-Y-E, or it can be two words, a-R-M space S-C-Y-T-H-E, a-K-A, the same spelling as the word scythe, arm scythe. So whenever I hear the term, I always imagine a grim reaper, but instead of holding a scythe, his arms are scythes, and instead of standing menacingly in a dark alley, he's walking through a wheat field under the blazing radiant sun, using his arms to cut wheat and his hood to mop sweat off his brow. Because you see, he may be a grim reaper by birth, but he is a hard-working farmer by choice. Then, with the garment right side out, I folded and ironed down the arm size seams and hand sewed them closed with a discreet felling stitch, leaving a skosh or so open because you'll see in a minute. Now, to make the mandarin collar, simply draft a mandarin collar, but instead of it going all the way around your neck, make it a few inches shorter so that it fits around the neck of your vest. Using this pattern, cut out three pattern pieces, two from your bedsheet and one from a much stiffer fabric. Sew these all together, right sides of the bedsheets together, with the stiffer fabric in out where, where it'll end up on the inside once you turn it right sides out. You can do it. I believe in just channel your inner Adolin. As this is a convex curve, cut out little pizzas from the seam allowance and then turn the collar right side out. 
Then to attach it to the vest, pin the backslash outside of the collar to the backslash outside of the vest, right sides together, and machine sew them together. Unless you can break the laws of physics, you may realize that this will not work with the inside of the collar, so you'll have to iron down a fold where you intend the seam to be, and then hand sew the collar to the vest with another felling stitch. And now it's time for the fun part. I sewed a line down all of the outer seams about 3 eighths of an inch from the edges. Then I used that line as a reference on which to hand sew this fancy golden trim from Hobby Lobby to emulate this piping. However, before I did this on the arms, so the arm sides were looking quite flat and dreary, whereas the picture looked like there was more rounded 3D bulk to them, so I threaded this craft foam through between the actual seams and the line that would be the trim twice, then I finished felling the seam together. I did something similar to add bulk to the lower seam, but instead of craft foam, I just finished the seam by cutting one side of the seam allowance in half and then folding the other side over that and zigzag stitching them together so that there were three strips of fabric sitting between the seam and the piping. Then I sewed these five shiny golden buttons to the right side and hand sewed five corresponding buttonholes on the left side. Now that the most complex and time-consuming part of the costume is done, reward yourself with a walk in the woods and an unexpected sighting of a flock of chickens. Wait, something isn't right here. The Walmart parking lot, that's where I saw the chickens. As mentioned before, the skirt is made up of four panels slid up the sides and front. The process of drafting a pattern for these panels was an exercise in finding a balance betwixt having slits that were large enough to plainly show the trousers beneath, but not so large as to shatter the illusion of a dress-like silhouette, leaving something that more resembles a mist coat with, like, four ribbons. Though one thing that helped was that the outer dart was at a perfect place to line up with the slits and make them look more purposeful, which just made me so disproportionately happy. I just, it was a good moment. Part of the drafting happened with the mock-up, then I cut out the bedsheet fashion fabric and made more alterations, then I attached the lining from whence still more alterations were necessary to get the look just right. Speaking of, so the outer fabric is the same as the vest fabric, but the lining is a different color. It's likely supposed to be the same as the trousers, which again were supposed to be the same as the shirt, but I had fabric from neither Neither of those sources left, so basically for everything vaguely this color and the whole costume, I adopted an eclectic nothing matches, so everything matches sort of vibe, and I ended up using gold poly silk for the lining. I don't know why, it's far too garish and shiny, so I used what they have dubbed the aesthetically challenged side rather than this gilded monstrosity. I just realized that I got blood on this because, well, I was, so I was walking around and then I stubbed my toe and I was like, oh, that's unpleasant. But then I didn't realize that I had straight up rayadined myself until I, uh, I gotta get this out. Once I finished both panels of one side, I traced those for the other side, attached the lining, and then hand sewed all of the panels to the waistcoat right under the piping. This skirt is described as being shorter than normal, which likely explains why there isn't the visible contrasting replaceable hem described in other habas. It's not long enough to touch the ground, so it isn't meant to receive the wear and tear that would necessitate such a feature. But I did just want to comment on how much I love that Sanderson included the detail of replaceable hems, not only because it's practical, but also because there is a long-standing historical precedent of having some sort of detachable or separate part at the bottom of floor-length skirts that would be washed and or replaced after being worn. In the Victorian era, skirts with trains would have a dust ruffle, or balayus, that would button to the train and would take most of the beading from the ground. Additionally, you could have trained petticoats worn underneath the skirt, which would protect the expensive skirt because you can always make another cheap bridge, I mean cotton petticoat. Similarly, in Edwardian walking skirts, they would often take a flat wool hem braid and fold it over the hem and fell it in place, which had the same purpose. Now it was time to add these useless but nevertheless whimsical buttons to each side, for which you might notice I added these angles in the skirt panels. I sewed them to the front panel right next to the slit and then just threaded and tied a loop of elastic thread through the adjacent panel and just put the buttonhole through that. Though the cloak is probably supposed to be symmetrical, I really like the way that it drapes in this action shot, so I just decided to adopt that as its natural state and do kind of like a Doctor Strange look. First I cut out an approximate cloak shape, then I tried it on and pinned one side further back along the frontal plane. I wanted this to have maximum swoopability, so to minimize bulk, instead of doing a rolled hem, I burned slash melted the edges, then just folded it over once and hemmed it like that, and oh goodness, it looked so very fun and cinematic. Then I wondered what it would look like with no extraneous light, and ooh, what a destructive beauty it has it. Also, doesn't that remind you of that one short story about the clock and butterfly blacksmith? Uh, this one that was all like, ooh, philosophy, how very meta it is when the very action of creating art becomes the visual art itself. Or, well, I hope that's what it was about, because I wrote an essay on it once, and that's what I said. But anyway, then I turned the light back on, as it's rather suitable for one to be able to see what one is doing when handling an open flame, and because this is not philosophy in action, child. The original plan for the closure was just to make it in the same manner as the picture using the buttons from the bodice, but as I was making this costume, I did a good amount of research on the Chinese chi pao, and during that 
that research, I came across this picture of a frog closure, and then my brain did this thing where it was like this plus this, and I just had a vision for it, you know, like during a high storm, and I had to do it. I started off by tracing the symbol. So I don't really know precisely what I'm doing here, but... Yeah, I couldn't find any tutorials for this specific type of closure, so I tinkered around and tried a lot of things, but here's what actually ended up working. Get some thick interfacing and cut it to the width of an asparagus and whatever length you want. Then cut 22 gauge wire to the same length and sew the wire to the middle of the interfacing. Cut some fusible interfacing to a bit more than double the width of the thick interfacing. Fold the fusible interfacing over the thick interfacing and wire and iron it down so that it sticks together and encloses everything. Then trim it down. Now take two strips of differently colored fabrics and sew them right sides together with a width a bit larger than your interfacing sandwich. Then flip them right sides out with a large needle or safety pin. Slither the interfacing sandwich into the fabric snakeskin, then bend it to your will until it makes two of this tree shape. One will have a hole and the other won't. To make them more sturdy, tight embroidery floss around these areas, Areas. Then make four of this quarter rest or Harry Potter scar shape and four of this checkmark shape. Now make a similar two-toned fabric snakeskin, but one that's a bit wider than the one before. This will make up these lines on the else collar symbol. Lay an appropriately lengthed piece against the tree and mark lines where the pieces line up with the branches of said tree. Now cut along the lines and sew as if they were buttonholes. Close off all of the ends by stuffing all of the fabric inside and then applying hot glue. Ow. Shimmy the piece onto the tree like so. Do the same thing for the other side and for the other tree. Now to actually make it work as a closure, you'll need something to act as the proverbial button to put through the proverbial buttonhole. I used the cording from the vest to make a knot, then I hot glued the ends together and hot glued and sewed them into the tree trunk. It looked kind of tacky, so I covered up the trunk with a nice line of security blanket. After putting some thick interfacing on the back of each side of the cloak where the closures will go, don the cloak and guesstimate their location and hot glue them down. You may subsequently decide that they weren't quite in the right place and decide to move them. If you do, be sure to move them just far enough so that the hot glue is as visible as your shame spread, but not so far away from the closure to where the hot glue no longer draws glaring attention to itself. Then re-hot glue it and stitch it down with some matching embroidery floss. Now time for the smaller pieces. Lay these out and stitch them down one at a time to complete the else collar symbol. The best way to do this, as I found, was to come through the top, stabbing the needle first through the piece, then through the cloak. To get these as stable as possible, stitch all the way around each of the pieces. I want to put the symbol of the Knight's Radiant on the back of the cloak, kind of like Amram did. Okay, I'm sorry, but symbols on cloaks, it's a good look. The only issue is that I've already embroidered it on another project, and it kind of took a while. And at this point, we were coming to the 11th hour, or 11th month, rather. I started this project 11 months prior, and I was still having a great time, but also maybe speeding a bit toward the light at the end of the tunnel. And this one will be about 5 million times bigger, so I figured I'll just make a soul caster, and then I can just use that to do some embroidery soul casting, because that's how it works, right? Yasuna's soul caster has three rings and a bracelet connected by chains holding three stones, a dark gray smokestone, a diamond, and a ruby. I thought I would just have to use plastic fakes of all of these precious stones, but flick my sparks because I found this smokestone hiding in my button box, this diamond hiding in a bag of fake gems at Joanne's, and this ruby in a table decoration which I borrowed. I did take some liberties, two rings instead of three on opposite fingers, plus the gemstones are supposed to be large ovals, however ovals are unsettling, circles are my favorite shape, and large jewelry makes me uncomfortable. I needed three gold 18 millimeter diameter double looped bezel pendant settings, and unsurprisingly, even this ridiculously specific request could be granted by the answer to all of our glyphs, Etsy. The gemstones weren't all the same size. The smallest one fit in the setting, but not the others, so I sanded them down. I also sanded the shank off the button. I got these rings at Target, and bonus, there are already holes in which to insert chain links. I used this picture for visual plagiarization because it was my absolute favorite rendition I found online. Basically, the only way I deviated from it was by making mine gold. Oh, you want to know a secret? Okay, I think I found a continuity error. I know, don't tell anyone. I don't know, I think someone confirmed maybe Yasuna's Soulcaster is supposed to be gold, but Shallan's is silver, but they're supposed to be identical. And wouldn't you know it, I had exactly the same problem. I found gold rings, gold chains, and gold pendant settings. But I couldn't find a gold bracelet that I liked and was in my price range. But I did find a silver cuff bracelet, like, I don't know, somewhere in my house, I think. So I did what Shalon obviously did off screen to make a match. But before I did that, I had to cover up the engraving on it, so I poured on some resin, then flipped it upside down and back every so often as it hardened so that it actually covered the engraving and didn't just pour off the sides, but then conversely didn't just drip off the front. Then you'll need some holes for chain attachment points before you spray paint it. I taped the pendant settings down where I wanted them to fall on my hand. Then I put the rings on and the bracelet and eyeballed how long each part of the chain needed to be. Then I cut it to that length, plus one or two chain links because I don't trust my eyeballs, and attached everything together. Now just hot glue the gemstones into the settings and give it a shake.
And voila, but if perchance you're not able to make a working soul caster, fear not, for I am a woman of the people, and I will show you how to embroider it. First, you'll need a picture of the symbol to transplant onto the cloak, and unless you have a thunderclass size printer, you'll have to print out the picture in pieces, then tape them together. Now use a sewing pin, shard blade, or other pointy object to poke holes in a rough outline of the symbol. For more stability, fuse a piece of thick interfacing to the wrong side of the cloak where you intend your embroidery to be. Tape the picture to the cloak, and use a sufficiently inky pen to draw dots through the holes, ensuring that the ink bleeds through to the fabric. Then play a game of connect the dots until the entire symbol is drawn out on the cloak. Then proceed to embroider the whole thing. The whole, the whole entire thing. And goodness, did this take a while. Whilst doing it, I listened to like 17 million Spanish podcasts. I listened through the audiobooks of Way of Kings and Words of Radiance. I watched Into the Woods, the musical, not the movie. I worked on it at Quad Rugby Practice, where someone dubbed it my battle clothing, which was much appreciated, and felt rather an accurate characterization, because toward the end there, I did feel like I was battling the cloak. Journey before destination. But I finally finished, then I took an iron to it in an attempt to hide how much difficulty I have with tension. Uh, please don't judge. This is only my second finished embroidery project. Well, third if you count this leaf. Now, I'm quite sure that I used to have a pair of black boots, uh, but I can't seem to find them, like, anywhere. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Maybe some lad eyes impersonating a horn eater stole them. I hear that happens sometimes. So instead, we're just going to take these, and we're going to spray paint them. All right, let's do this. I know this is probably just supposed to be part of the shirt, but my first thought when seeing it was Naval Ascot because of the way it puffs out, and since the front of my shirt is, yeah, we're just going to cover it up. And, of course, I used yet another fabric because eclecticness. Anyway, this is more or less how I remember Ascot's being constructed. You just fold the top strip over twice and then secure it around your neck with the Velcro. Yasuna's makeup is always flawless, and I tried, but does BB cream actually... whatever, so I just put on a layer of scholarly confidence and left it at that. For my hair, I did a twisty thing which turns into a braid on both sides, and then I made them into a half-up bun, and it gave me Yasuna vibes, so I went with it. Then I just curled it. Now for the hair spikes. Now I know the whole crustacean equals stormlight archive joke is like really old, but I swear this is an accident. I got these at an estate sale like eight years ago, and look, there are... there are crabs on them. How perfect. Anyway, we're gonna see if we can get these in amidst all the bobby pins. All good.
Hi, thank you so much for watching. I'm sorry it was so long. If you're still here, you're a champ. I hope you got some joy from this manifestation of my love of Stormlight. If you like this video, be sure to always remember the most important step or stitch a man or woman can make. Also, there are only Words of Radiant spoilers in the video. No promises about the comments, so be careful.